marvellous introduction. Mr. Smith. Uh, my Lord, indeed. May it please, my Lord, um, I appear uh, with my learned friend, Mrs. Wells, for the Republic of South Africa uh, in this matter. My learned friend, Mr. Hoffmar, Queen's Counsel, appears with Ms. Larty uh, and Mr. Miles uh, for the respondents, Argentum Exploration. Uh, this is our appeal, brought with the permission of Sir Nigel Tier, who was the first instance judge, and it is an appeal against the whole of paragraphs 1 and 4 of the learned judge's order dated 16th of December 2020, by which he dismissed our application to strike out or set aside the in-rem claim form, uh, and also ordered that the Republic should pay uh, the claimant's costs of that application on the standard basis. Uh, the application uh, which was dismissed is in tab 11 um, of the core bundle. Um, I don't think we need to turn it up, but that sets out the grounds of the application and the two limbs of the application. The order we appeal against is at uh, tab 6 of the core bundle. Uh, that was the order made um, pending a hand-down hearing on the 16th of December 2020. And the order granting permission is at tab 7 um, of the core bundle, uh, core bundle page 80. Um, that order at tab 7 also records that the parties had reached an agreement as to the amount of costs payable to save there having to be any summary or detailed assessment. On this appeal, uh, we ask for this court to substitute uh, an order either striking out or setting aside uh, the claim form, ordering the claimant to pay our costs of the application and the appeal, um, and ordering the claimant to repay the sum it paid in relation to costs, sorry, that we paid. Um, the respondent uh, seeks to uphold the order of the learned judge on the grounds relied upon by the learned judge and on six additional grounds set out in the respondent's notice. Um, if I can start very briefly with two what I hope are small housekeeping matters arising out of footnote six of my learned friend's well, How about we start with timing, Mr Smith? Have you agreed uh, timing between you? Uh, my Lord, obviously, subject to the court's approval, uh, Mr. Hoffmeyer and I ha have agreed that the following, that I'm going to aim to be about four hours today, um, so saving myself about an hour for tomorrow, but allowing for, for breaks. Uh, he then has five hours beginning today and going over in tomorrow, and hopefully I've saved myself an hour for reply tomorrow. And you'll finish comfortably by 4.15 tomorrow, which is an absolute deadline. Indeed, my Lord. Perfect. Back to footnote six, was it? It was footnote six of my learned friend's skeleton argument, which is at tab four, um, page 52 um, of the core bundle, uh, where my learned friends say that we don't have permission to appeal um, against the learned judge's costs order um, or against his determination of that part of the application that turned on article 25 of the salvage convention. Um, just to deal with those two points uh, briefly, if I may, and obviously I'll come back to them later if I need to. But in reverse order, um, it is said we don't have permission uh, to um, appeal in relation to costs because the costs order reflected what was agreed between the parties. And as I've shown my lords already, after the judge provided his judgment in draft, we sought to agree consequential um, matters. Um, in those circumstances, the order at tab six was made uh, without a hearing for consequentials pending a hearing, and that order provided that we should pay the costs to be assessed if uh, not agreed. Um, that was at um, page 79 of the bundle, be assessed on the standard basis. Um, subsequently, as I've said to my lords, we were able to agree an amount to an avoid an assessment, and that was dealt with in the uh, in subsequent order in which we were given permission. So we would submit that the fact that the amount paid was subsequently agreed does not mean that we don't have permission to appeal against the whole of the judge's order at tab 6, which includes the order that we should pay costs. Um, the other point is the suggestion that we do not have permission to appeal against the judge's decision on Article 25 of the Salvage Convention. Um, it is correct, uh, my lords, that none of our grounds specifically refer to Article 25, but that is because we submit um, they don't need to. Um, the learned judge dealt with um, Article 25 briefly. Um, if I could ask my lords to have page 179, sorry, page 113 of the core bundle, which is paragraph 179 to 180. 
Perhaps you can use paragraph numbers for the judgment, um, Mr. Smith, if you don't mind. Uh, 179 and 180. Yeah, no, no I've got it. Thanks. Um, where the learned judge dealt with um, Article 25 of the Salvage Convention and essentially held that because the Salvage Convention referred to um, claims against non-commercial cargo as being uh, attracting immunity, in the light of his conclusions as to the commerciality of the cargo, Article 25 took us no further forwards. Um, and as my lords will have seen, uh, all of our grounds of appeal maintain the case that this was a non-commercial cargo, and we therefore submit that it is open to us to argue on appeal that Article 25 is engaged just as Section 10 of the State Immunity Act um, is not engaged. I mean, it's pretty unlikely this case is going to be decided on technical grounds as to what uh, can be said and what can't be said, but we'll hear Mr Hoffmeyer on his technical points later. M my Lord, that is why I said um, I hoped I could deal with this briefly, and I'll come back to it by way of reply, um, if, if I may. Yeah. Um, so, my Lord, um, uh, with, with that introduction, can I give the Court um, a, a brief roadmap as to where I will be going uh, with my submission? Um, firstly, I intend to give a brief um, uh, overview by way of seven key points of principle as to why we submit that the Republic is entitled to immunity. Secondly, I'm going to introduce briefly the facts insofar as they are uh, relevant to the appeal. Um, thirdly, and before moving on to our specific grounds of appeal, I'm going to look at two specific uh, aspects of the law in relation to state immunity because uh, we believe that they... Um, affect all of the grounds, and those two specific um, aspects of the law in relation to state immunity are the relevance of customary international law and the relationship between adjudicative and enforcement jurisdiction. And those are issues that then come up in a number of the different grounds, and so I'm going to deal with them at the outset and then just refer back to what I've said when dealing with the individual grounds. Fourthly, um, I will then go through each of our individual grounds uh, and develop our arguments insofar as necessary building on the overview. And finally, I should look briefly, um, insofar as appropriate for my opening, um, at some of the points made in the respondent's notice, but l largely, and I hope helpfully, to say that many of the points made in the respondent's notice are not in dispute. So, um, moving on uh, to what I described as my opening uh, overview, seven key points of principle. The first key point of principle is that by Section uh, 1 of the State Immunity Act, the Republic is immune from the jurisdiction of this court except as provided um, in the exceptions. So it may assist to have uh, the Act open, which is in the Authorities Bundle, tab 1, page 1. So, Section 1, 1, a state is immune from the jurisdiction of the courts of the United Kingdom, except as provided in the following parts of this Act. That is broadly in relation to the adjudicative jurisdiction of this court. And then similarly, in section 13, if I could ask my lords to go to page 7 in the same tab, um, under other procedural privileges, um, section 13.2, subject to subsections 3 and 4 below, relief shall not be given against the state by way of injunction or order for specific performance or for the recovery of land or other property. And 13.2b, uh, the property of the state are not to be subject to any process for the enforcement of a judgment or arbitration award or in an action in REM for its arrest, detention or sale. So uh, the first key point principle is I I immunity unless otherwise provided. The second um, key point of principle is that English law, uh, like customary international law, recognises and gives effect to the restrictive theory of state immunity. In the Act, it does so by setting out in sections two and following a number of exceptions to immunity, which broadly apply where the state is acting jure gestionis rather than jure imperii. What are the translations of those terms? Uh, in a uh, sovereign capacity rather than in a commercial capacity. I don't think it would be a literal translation, my lord, but we would say... Well, why do we need the Latin, then, if, it's, um, if, if those are the translations? I mean, I, I do find the use of Latin in this and other areas um, unfortunate in 2022. Uh, one of my predecessors tried very hard to erase it from these courts and failed. Uh, but I'm going to try a little harder, Mr Smith. So if, if what you're saying is the distinction between sovereign and 
commercial, then let's use those terms. Why? If there is some inward importance in the Latin that is different, then tell me. Uh, m my Lord, I'm content to um, anglicise those phrases. Yeah, and I do find it, I find it actually um, difficult to persuade people uh, to change their approach, but it is something we do have to try for because we want to make these courts transparent and intelligible to those looking at them on the live stream. Uh, my, my Lord, I will um, avoid the Latin. Um, Thank you. Uh, and other Latin, if you can, Mr. Smith. Well, my Lord, the, 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 the one difficulty I have um, it, it is um, the action in REM. Um, and I think I might struggle to keep saying the action well, against the thing. Okay. Um, but I, if, if my Lord would prefer... You want an excuse... You want a, you want permission to be excused <laughs> from an action in REM? Well, my, my I, Lord, I don't think you should have it, but um, <laughs> I'm prepared to give you a temporary one. <laughs> well, uh, my Lord, uh, I, I will... I hear what my Lord says, and I will do the best and I can to get out. And your in is the, the other thing, and the whereas a personal is. action would be perfectly satisfactory. <laughs> an action in personam, wouldn't it? Uh, I, I, indeed, my Lord. Mm. Um, okay, so well... Anyway, so, I've, made, so I've Lord, made my point. It, uh, and it is well taken, my Lord. Um, so the um, re restrictive theory distinguishes yeah. between um, acts of, of, of the state in a commercial capacity as against acts of the state in a sovereign capacity. Um, and um, if I could ask my Lords, just because I think it helps in terms of that definition, to have um, divider nine of the authorities bundle, page 195, of the internal pagination, a uh, case we will come back to again later. The, the, the Premier Congresso del Partido, uh, and just to turn up what Lord Wilberforce said um, about this distinction in, in, in that case, at internal page 263 of the report, uh, page 195, um, in, in my opinion, this argument, though in itself generally acceptable, burps or begs the essential question, which is what is the relevant act? So that's a theme I'll be coming back to during the course of my submission. Sorry, the court I'm needs to I'm ask I'm itself. Sorry. It's, um, the electronic numbers, of course, do not match the, um, the numbers in the bundle. So um, it's at page 195. 195 of where, the electronic bundle. Whereabouts? Um, just under letter B, my lord, page 263 of the report. It assumes... Um, and, and the passage is in the second line of the paragraph, the essential question, which is, what is the relevant act? Oh, I see. So the court needs to be asking, what is the relevant act, when considering whether this is a sovereign act um, or a commercial act? Um, and and uh, later on, uh, Lord Wilberforce, at page 267, um, some uh, uh, additional guidance which we say is useful in this context. So it's page 199, of the electric, uh, electronic bundle, I hope. Um, the very last paragraph at letter H, um, a, 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 or G, where the paragraph starts. The question is whether the Republic of Cuba, in, in this case it was the Republic of Cuba claiming immunity, can claim immunity depends, if I am right as to law, on an examination of those acts in respect of which the claim is asserted. So the court needs to be looking at the acts of the state in respect of which um, the um, uh, claim is asserted. And a few lines further on, the question is whether the acts which give rise to an alleged cause of action were done in the context of a trading relationship or were done by the government of the Republic of Cuba acting wholly outside the trading uh, relationship. And so the importance there is that the acts which give rise to the cause of action have to have a nexus with the trading relationship, with the commercial activity. Um, and similarly, uh, Lord Bridge, later on in the judgment at page 210 of the bundle, page 278 of the report, at letter G, um, says the following. First, if a state voluntarily assumes a purely private law obligation, it cannot, when that obligation is sought to be enforced against it, claim sovereign immunity on the ground that the reason for assuming the obligation was a sovereign governmental character. So again, what we see here is the focus on the act that gave rise to the cause of action. So um, all of these formulations we submit require a link between the commercial activity and the cause of action relied on by the claimant. 
That is to say, to use the words of Section 3 of the Act, that the action, the cause of action, is based on or related to the commercial activity. And so, um, going back to the Act, um, if I may, tab 1, that is why um, Section 3 refers to proceedings relating to a commercial transaction. That's at um, tab 1, page 2, Section 3, 1. So um, that is um, the second point of principle. The third um, key point of principle in our submission is that when considering the immunity of the estate from property um, of state-owned property, uh, the court's enforcement jurisdiction, um, a, a different approach is taken. Um, and this reflects the fact that there is no act or transaction directly affecting the property. So that's why I took my lords to Lord Wilberforce and Lord Bridge, who were emphasising the, the nexus between the act and the cause of action. When the state simply owns property and we are looking at enforcement proceedings, there's no relevant act. Uh, and there's no relevant act in respect of which the claim is asserted, to use Lord Wilberforce's words, and the claiming party is not seeking to enforce a private law obligation which the state has assumed, to use Lord Bridge's words. So a slightly different test than in relating to is required. And, and we submit that that is why section 13, um, because we're looking at in, in enforcement for these proceedings, um, is concerned with the use um, that the um, a, uh, property is put to. It looks at what the uh, state is doing or intends to do with the property. So subsection 3 of section 13 removes um, immunity. Um, when there is consent, um, and subsection 4 removes Sorry, immunity. Sorry, where are you? Section 3 of? The State Immunity Act. Se section um, 3, not section sorry, 13. Sorry, section 13, 13, subsection 3. Right, okay. Apologize. Can you be clear? I do apologize. So, uh, tab 1, page 7, section 13, subsection 3, um, r removes immunity where there is consent, and then subsection 4 removes immunity uh, where the property which is, for the time being, in use or intended for use for commercial purposes. That is the test for enforcement um, purposes. And the definition that goes with that is at section 17, section, uh, subsection 1, commercial purposes means the purposes of such transactions or activities as are mentioned in section 3, subsection 3. And if we go back to section 3, subsection 3, there is then a definition of commercial transactions. So what we have to examine is whether the property is in use or intended for use for the purposes of a commercial transaction. Uh, and that is the test to be applied for enforcement um, proceedings. If the property is in use or if the state intends to use the property for commercial purposes, then it is not immune. Other property is immune. The fourth key point, having looked at adjudicative and enforcement um, jurisdiction is that an admiralty claim against the thing is a hybrid because it involves establishing both jurisdiction against the defendant the, the, the person who, who, who is impleaded um, and also adjudicative jurisdiction over the state merely on the basis that the relevant property happens to be within the jurisdiction but the admiralty action against the thing also exposes the property in question to the risk um, of enforcement. And so, as I say, this kind of action, Lord Wilberforce said in uh, the Premier Congress, so, it is uh, a hybrid, but um, it's dealt with in Section 10. What the legislature has done uh, is to apply the same test as for enforcement proceedings. So, um, looking at cargo rather than the ship because we're concerned with the cargo the relevant test is set out in section 10 4a um, page 5 tab 1 of the authorities bundle the state is not immune as respects an action um, wh where I'm reading forgive me my lord I'll stick with the Latin if I may the state is not immune as respects an action in REM against a cargo belonging to that state if both the cargo and the ship carrying it were at the time when the cause of action arose in use or intended for use for commercial purposes. So that is exactly the same wording 
um, as used in section 13, and the definition is the same definition from section 17. Uh, uh, and that is why we say the same principles apply when looking at the adjudicative jurisdiction of the court for an action against the thing uh, as uh, apply when looking at the enforcement jurisdiction of the court. So it is again, as with enforcement, necessary to consider whether the property in question is in use for the purposes of a commercial transaction. And we submit it significant for these purposes that section 10.4 like section 13, reflect and faithfully apply the restrictive theory um, of state immunity that I referred to earlier. Related to that, the fifth key point of principle is that the only exception to the general immunity in section 1, which our gentum can and does rely on, is the exception we've just looked at in section 10.4. We therefore submit that the issue for this court, court is simply whether at the time that our gentleman's cause of action arose, if it has one, um, the silver was in use or intended for use for commercial purposes. That is to say, for the purposes of a commercial transaction. The sixth key uh, point of principle is that the claimant's uh, cause of action, um, again, if it has one, um, accrued in 2017. Um, in June, uh, on our case, when the recovery of the silver was completed, in um, early October, the 2nd of October, on our gentleman's case, which is when the silver arrived in this jurisdiction, and it says that is when the salvage operation was completed. At this time, the Republic, the owner of the cargo, was not doing anything with the silver. It was not in use for any purpose, still less for a commercial purpose. Uh, it is not suggested that it was intended for use in any particular purpose, still less for a commercial purpose. That and indeed, would be true, would it not, of any cargo at the bottom of the sea? My lady, almost any. Um, I can conceive of circumstances in which um, if there was a, a cargo that was uh, lost to the bottom of the sea uh, very temporarily, which was in a specific use before it was sunk, um, it might be said uh, that, that, that it was in use. Um, if there was, I, I'm trying to think it's always difficult, but if there was, for example, um, a, a remote operating grip owned by the state that was being carried from one place to another, it might be said that if it was lost during the course of operations, that it was still in use because it was actively being used for that purpose. But in general, I, I would agree with my latest point. The cargo at the bottom of the sea is not going to be in use for anything. Well, might, might, might it be in use if the state cargo owner has entered into a salvage contract with the salvor? Suppose, suppose we were looking at a claim by Odyssey in, in this case and that they had salved it. I mean, could it be said in, in those circumstances that the Republic were using the cargo <coughs> for purposes of the salvage operation? Uh, my Lord, it, it would not need to be because Odyssey would um, be able to remove our immunity by relying on Section 3 mm -hmm. because there is a commercial transaction which is the salvage contract and also there would be in there would be jurisdiction against the person of the Republic uh, under Section 10 uh, 4B. Well, Section 3 is, it doesn't apply, does it, in every case because 10 6 says that sections 3 to 5 don't apply to in rem proceedings if the state in question is a party to the 1926 Brussels Convention. Which and the Republic things. was not. And so that, that doesn't... Quite, but we've got to look at... We're looking at things more generally. Uh, um, uh, so section 3 won't always be a, a, an answer. Um, my, my Lord, no. But in terms of establishing uh, jurisdiction over the defendant, there is jurisdiction under Section 10 or B um, in those circumstances. And as to whether there would then be jurisdiction for an enforcement action in REM if an arrest was required um, uh, under the action against the cargo, uh, that would turn on Section 13. So we would be back to in use uh, for commercial purposes. And then one would need to consider whether the 
Republic was using the cargo in a meaningful sense by being party to a salvage contract. Um, in that situation, um, our submission would be, um, as it was in front of the judge for the period after the cause of action arose, that no, that is not a commercial purpose um, for the purposes of this test, because we are intending to realize the cargo, uh, to sell part of it and pay the net proceeds to the national fund, which we would submit was a, a sovereign purpose for those purposes. Well, that focuses on the purpose, but uh, what we're, what we're, I think what my latest question was is focusing on whether the cargo is being used. And that's why I was exploring the idea of it being used for salvage purposes. W whether one characterizes those as commercial or not, um, uh, you're, you're I'm, I'm, potentially I'm, not in a situation where any cargo at the bottom of the sea is not going to be in use. Uh, my Lord, yes, um, and I, I will be coming on to this. I, I don't want to bat it away, but um, Lord Clark in um, Savas um, said um, that there was some helpful material there, which I will be coming. I can take my Lord straight. No, to no, that. don't, 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 don't um, take you but, out. But essentially, course. for the purposes of a transaction, means something more than just loosely connected with the transaction. It has to be required to, to make the transaction work. Um, and, and I'll come back to Savas if I can. And, and revert specifically to this point, but it would be our submission that the cargo was not in use for the purposes of the transaction, as well as the fact that the transaction was not. Yeah, I, I understand that. So speaking of myself, um, I, 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 at the moment, take one scrot to look at, at, at the thing in two stages. First of all, is there use? And then secondly, is it for commercial purposes as, as, as defined? And has to apply that to uh, the cargo uh, and the ship, or in the case of in personam liability, the ship only. But in the case of, as I understand it, that's the framework. My, my, my lord, yes. And there was a debate uh, while we're just on the um, uh, section 10.4b, which I think my lord was just referring to, the claim directly against the Republic. Um, we do not contend for a construction of 10.4b. Um, my lord may have noticed in the Altair case, um, Mr Justice Gross, as he then was, had to do with the submission that 10.4b, the reference to such cargo, meant a cargo in use or intended for use. Uh, we don't contend for that construction of 10.4b, just in case that is, is relevant to my lord's consideration. No. Such cargo means a state-owned cargo. Yes. Um, and, and so uh, we do say uh, that the, the property, the silver, was not commercial uh, property. And, and if we are right on that, re reverting to, to the sixth point I was on, um, of when the cause of action arose in 2017, um, we are immune both under Section 1, because Section 10 is not engaged, and also under Article 25 um, of the Salvage Convention. And in uh, their skeleton argument, uh, my learned friends suggest, and this is core uh, tab 4, page 50, paragraph 3, that there is no evidence um, as to our intended use of the cargo. Uh, and they make the point that there's no witness statement from someone on behalf of the Republic saying that our intended use in 2017 uh, was sovereign. And they say but that's significant because obviously some nobody could have signed such a witness statement. That is, uh, with respect, uh, not quite correct. Uh, we say, as I mentioned to my Lord a moment ago, that the intention in 2017, insofar as it's relevant, after the cause of action accrued, which, which is not, but insofar as one is looking post-October 2017, the intention was to sell the silver, uh, to realise enough to cover the costs of a recovery by Odyssey, and to pay the balance into the National Fund. Um, that is dealt with in a witness statement by Mr Schultz, which is in the core bundle. I don't think we need to turn it up, because I hope this isn't going to be contentious, but at paragraph 13, he sets out that that was the intention when we did finally form an intention. That's what we were going to do. And that, we submit, was not a commercial act, e even if it was relevant. Well, on the, on the judge's findings, there was no intention at the time the cause of action arose Indeed. as to, on the part of the Republic, as to what should be done with the silver. There, there was no intention that had been formed at that stage, and we say that's an end of the matter. But my learned friends make the point that we haven't put in a witness statement saying, but even after that, our intention was sovereign, and I just want well, that, to... That was the that judge's, point. you say that was the judge's finding. Um, so um, the final key uh, point of principle is that even if it is appropriate to look at the position in 1942, 
then giving the words in use or intended for use for commercial purposes their ordinary and natural meaning. The silver was not in use uh, for any purpose at that stage, still less for a commercial purpose. It was simply silver owned by the Union. Um, it was not uh, in use for the purpose of the FOB sale contract. Um, that was a contract by which it was acquired. It was not in use for the purpose of the contract of carriage. That was the contract pursuant to which it was being carried. But insofar as 1942 is relevant, the silver was intended for use in the South African mint, minting coins, which we say um, is a sovereign act. Uh, and in far as it's need necessary to go further, the greater part of the silver was intended on the judge's findings of fact for use minting union coins rather than coins for Egypt. Um, and that of it is a sovereign act and entitled to immunity under Section 1. The immunity is not removed by... So you say the act. judge's finding is enough for you that the greater part was to be used for sovereign coins? Uh, my lord, we do, and we base ourselves as the judge would have done if he had had to then proceed to a decision on that on the Parliament Belge, uh, which we'll uh, come on to look at. Yeah. But essentially where the substantial purpose is sovereign, um, that is sufficient. Uh, otherwise, we might find ourselves in the situation of having to say that 2,000 of the silver bars were immune and the other 361 yeah. were <coughs> not immune. Uh, and certainly, um, uh, my understanding of the practice in salvage matters is to treat the whole of the cargo uh, 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 as one body. And if one does that, providing <coughs> the use um, is substantially sovereign, then the cargo is a sovereign cargo. It doesn't lose its status as a sovereign cargo merely because part of it is going to be used. Uh, and, and I'll come back to um, the Parliament Belgium on that. Which was the case of the arrest of a ship, and you can't arrest part of a ship. Uh, I mean, we, 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 we understandably focus in this case on the consequences of the arguments for salvage, but we perhaps have to also keep in mind that there are all sorts of other admiralty proceedings in REM that aren't concerned with salvage at all. My Lord, absolutely. Uh, but um, countervailing that argument is, uh, are two points. Firstly, the specific test we are concerned with in Section 10.4a does only relate to cargoes. Uh, relating to that, Article 25 does only relate to cargoes. But, not only, but it doesn't apply only to salvage of cargo. There may be all sorts of uh, in rem proceedings in relation to state owned cargoes. You might have an injurious cargo which damages the ship. You might have a negligently stowed cargo where the state cargo owner is responsible for stowage. One can imagine a lot of in rem proceedings that aren't salvage. My, my Lord, with respect, I mean, none of those would give rise to a, an action against the thing. Um, I will come on to deal with this and to look briefly at Section 20 uh, of the Supreme Court, as Senior Court Act. Um, but um, the. Um, so, what did you say? None of those would give rise, rise to a claim against the thing. Right. Uh, a claim against the thing is only available in limited circumstances. And there are only. Um, let, perhaps if we look at it now, um, while we're on the point, my Lord, it may be convenient. Uh, we have the Supreme Court Act at tab 2 um, of the authorities' bundle, <coughs> uh, starting at page 11. Uh, section 20 of the Act deals with the Admiralty Jurisdiction of the High Court. And before we go through the Admiralty Jurisdiction, um, if I could ask my Lords um, to go forward to page 15 of the bundle, section 21 deals with the mode of exercise of Admiralty Jurisdiction. Um, and section uh, 21 1, subject to section 22, an action for SONAM may be brought in the High Court in all cases within the Admiralty Jurisdiction. Section 21 2, in any such uh, case of any such claim as is mentioned in section 22a, c, or x, or any question mentioned in 22b, an action in REN may be brought in the High Court against the ship or property in connection with which the claim arises. So the claim in REN is only available in the case of those subparagraphs. So if we turn back to the subparagraph, a is a claim to the possession or ownership of the ship, so that doesn't apply to a cargo. Uh, c is a claim in respect to mortgage or charge on a ship. So that doesn't apply to a cargo. Um, S 
is any claim to the forfeiture or condemnation of a ship or goods which um, uh, are being or have been carried or attempt to be carried in a ship or for the restoration of the ship or such goods after seizure or for droits of admiralty. Um, that is the only, my lord, residual car uh, case of, of a claim which gives rise to uh, an action in rem against cargo. And in each of those cases, because we are dealing with possession of the cargo, immunity would in our submission be engaged under section 13 because all of those require there to be possession uh, uh, and claims for adverse possession. So the only case in respect to claim uh, in REM for cargo will exist um, is the uh, sweeper, uh, which is where there is a maritime lien, which is section 21.3, and the categories of maritime lien um, are notoriously closed, one of which is salvage, but I don't believe, and I'm sure Mr. Hoffman will correct me if I'm wrong, that there is any category of maritime lien against the cargo apart from the salvage maritime lien. Mm. Uh, uh, and therefore, uh, to, to go back to, to my Lord's point, in fact, when we're looking at claims in REM against cargo, we are almost exclusively dealing with salvage. Well, we'll hear whether that's common ground in due course. My, my, my. Um, uh, and, and so, uh, again, to, to come back, um, I said there were two reasons to, to engage with my, my Lord's point. The other one, of course, is that under Article 25 of the Salvage Convention, the claim of REM is um, dealt with at Article 25, whereas claims here against the ship are dealt with, I think it's Article 6 of the Salvage Convention. So we're dealing with a separate article of the Convention. And the convention has a specific provision. It might help to look at it since I've referred to it a few times. It's a divided three of my Lord's authorities bundle. I'm sorry, I was wrong a moment ago. It's Article 4 deals with state owned vessels at page 22 of the bundle. And Article 25 is the one we're concerned with at page 28 of my Lord's bundle. Uh, unless the state owner consents, no provisions of this convention uh, shall be used as a basis for seizure, arrest, or detention by any legal process of, nor for any proceedings in REM against non commercial cargoes owned by a state and entitled at the time of salvage operations to sovereign immunity under generally recognised principles of international law. So the cargo is dealt with separately and compendiously, and the convention, certainly, which is salvage specific, does not distinguish between the adjudicative um, in REM jurisdiction and the enforcement in REM jurisdiction. It grants immunity in relation to both. Um, and that, we say, submit, supports our argument that Section 10 should be construed, the, the words in use or intended for use in Section 10 should be construed the same as in Section 13 of the Act. So, um, my lords, having made my seven headline points, and before I uh, turn uh, briefly to facts, just to deal with a couple of other points by way of introduction. It has been suggested in argument that the Republic, my clients, are seeking to avoid a liability for salvage, or that there is something, I think, unconscionable about our position, and that it would be somehow surprising if we were entitled to immunity. And I'd like to deal with those points, if I may, right at the outset, taking them in turn. Firstly, um, at their skeleton, um, at paragraph 2, which is page 50 of tab 4 of the court, my learned friends say that we have accepted that Argentum is in principle entitled to salvage. Uh, that is not the case. There is, or there will be, very real issues, firstly, as to whether the claim is time barred, secondly, as to whether Argentum is the correct claimant, um, it contracted, and indeed its contractor then subcontracted the whole of the salvage operation to the actual owners of the salving vessel um, in question. Um, and thirdly, there will be an issue as to whether Argentum's contact conduct um, engages Article 18 of the Salvage Convention so as to deprive it of some or all of its award. Um, those issues, and if we're wrong about them, the amount of salvage due, all have to be decided by a competent court. And that is the question that we're concerned with, whether this court is the competent court to resolve those issues. So we're not seeking, again, referring to paragraph two of my learned friend's skeleton argument, to get out of an obligation to pay salvage. Nor, um, as the learned judge um, seems to consider, and just for my lord's note, the paragraphs are nine, 
155, 161, 164, and 170, he referred to this on a number of occasions, are we seeking to avoid to pay what is properly due as determined by a court that has jurisdiction? We're simply maintaining that we have... So what happens if you, if you succeed um, and this action is struck out? How, how would they obtain salvage? Uh, m my Lord, in our argument, they won't. But that is not a consequence of the fact that we've asserted sovereign immunity. It's a consequence of the fact that they didn't bring their claim in time and protect time. So that is a consequence of the limitation provisions of the salvage convention, which set a two-year limit. Um, uh, uh, and so, my lord, that is the reason why um, they may end up with nothing. Of course, uh, as the court is aware, there is a claim form against the, the Republic rather than against the cargo, which was issued um, at about the same time as the application last year. And, and there is, we, we contend, the option of proceedings in South Africa, although we would say um, that they are time-barred as well because South Africa is, is a signatory to the Salvage Convention, the same as the United Kingdom is. But yes, I don't shirk from the fact that if we are right, the end result will be no salvage payable, um, subject to my learned friend's point that we cannot obtain release of the cargo from the receiver of wreck unless and until we pay some salvage. But my lord, there is that's because of the time bar point rather than specifically because of the state of immunity. And, and, and but for the time bar point, would you be amenable to suit here on a claim in personam because it would come under the gateway of claim relating to um, there would probably be an argument as to whether we uh, were susceptible to a, a personal claim here because of the question of whether the gateway is engaged, and that turns on the same point as to uh, when the cause of action accrued. Because my learned friend's case is that bringing the cargo to the United Kingdom was part of the salvage operation, and that therefore part of the contract was performed here, not the contract, but part of the operation was performed here, and therefore he gets within a, a, an in a personal um, gateway. Uh, we say that the salvage operation concluded in June when the last of silver was raised, therefore no relevant act was done in this jurisdiction, and therefore they don't get within the gateway. But my lord, they would be within section 10.4b, so if they were within the gateway, there would be no immunity. Aren't they within the gateway, which is, I think, in paragraph 11 of claim relating to property, which is located in this jurisdiction? Well, if I may, I'd like to keep my powder dry on that. That will be sub sub substantially in dispute in circumstances where the property was bought here, and it's, it's movable property and was bought here with, without our knowledge or consent. But, my, my Lord, that is one of the gateways relied on in relation to the, the personal claim. So the only way they actually get any salvage, you say, is uh, by relying on the fact that the receiver of Rex will not release the cargo until salvage is paid, is that? going to help them? Um, well, my lord, our submission would be not. Um, that is not going to help them. That's not going to help them, but that again it, it is for another day. So I, I don't shirk. So, so your point, I mean, this was a point that you're not seeking to avoid liability for salvage, but I mean, being brutally honest, um, Mr. Smith, it does sound as if you actually are. Well, well you accept, lord, I think, don't you, that you would be susceptible to a personal claim in South Africa? Absolutely. Well, subject to time. Uh, subject to time. Subject to time. Exactly so. Exactly so. Um, and and um, perhaps I should have refined the point slightly. Um, and it's this: it's that we don't rely on state immunity to avoid the liability. If the liability is avoided, it is because of the time bar provisions of the salvage. Uh, 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 and that. Um, leads into a, a, a second and, and also equally fundamental point, which is that if we are immune under the Act, then subject to having waived that immunity under Section 2, which clearly there's no allegation that we've, we've done that, this Court simply does not have jurisdiction. Issues of sovereign immunity are not matters um, of, of discretion. And we'll be looking at um, Lord Sumption in, in Ben Carbouche in due course, but at paragraphs 17 and 19, he makes it I'm there. not sure we need Lord Sumption for that. Uh, no. My Lord, Mr. Smith, no, I agree. think we understand full well that we do not have discretion about sovereign immunity. And, and so, my Lord, it goes slightly further than that. Even if we had not acknowledged service, as we can do under the Admiralty proceedings in relation to a claim against the thing, in order to appear 
in order to challenge jurisdiction. The court would, in due course, have had to consider the question of immunity of its own motion. It's obliged to under the Act. And if we are right, the court would have been decline, uh, obliged to decline jurisdiction without any intervention on the part of the Republic. And again, that brings me back to the point I was making. So therefore, it's not us relying on state immunity. It's not really a merits point at all. If you're right, you're right. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. Well, my lord, um, I will move on uh, from that point then. So uh, th that brings me, um, if I may, and I'll take this briefly because I don't think there's any serious dispute for this, um, to, to the facts um, relating to the claim. And we, we may just need to look at some of the timing. The um, facts are the best bit, Mr. Smith. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, uh, my, my usually for me to say that. <laughs> And, and perhaps particularly act in, in, in the light of the... Um, I was hoping you were going to take us through the telexes and the correspondence of 1942, <laughs> um, which make marvellous reading. My Lord, I'm going to um, resist the temptation to do so. Yeah, I um, thought you might. That's why um, I went to the first. In, in one or two um, respects. Um, but um, particularly relevant, I, I, I thought, in the light of the discovery of um, Shackleton's ship last week. Now that we see a no, it's more. absolutely fascinating insight. So, my lord, um, the reason I don't need to take you to many of the telexes, because happily the parties were able to agree virtually all the facts and all of the issues of South African law, which we're going to arise on, which the court will have seen, are all set out in a document called the Common Ground, which is in a tab one of the supplemental bundle. So that's why we don't need to look at very much apart from the Common Ground. The case concerns, as we all know, the 2,391 bars of silver which were recovered from the wreck. Um, and, um, the, the background to that is that they were purchased by the South African Mint on FOB terms. So the, the starting point, really, in terms of the claim to sovereign immunity, is that the South African Mint was established in 1942 under the South African Mint Act of 1941. That's at paragraph one of the common ground. It was not a separate legal entity, but was part of the Department of Finance under the executive authority of the Minister of Finance. That's paragraph two. The director of the Mint was authorised to mint union coinage, but also authorised and obliged to mint non-union coinage if directed to do so by the minister. So the decision to mint non-union coinage was a political one by the minister, not by the director of the Mint. That's paragraph 6 and 7. Um, our case was and is, as I've said, that the silver was intended for use in sovereign purposes. And the judge held, as a matter of fact, that the greater part of the silver was destined for use as union coin. That's paragraph 44 of the judgment, uh, core bundle, page 90. There's no appeal from that finding of fact. Uh, we submitted and submit that that is a sovereign purpose, using the silver, the greater part of it, uh, for the production of union coin. Uh, the judge uh, said, um, at uh, paragraph 178 of the judgment, uh, that uh, had the silver been designated solely for union coin, he would have regarded that uh, as a sovereign purpose. He went on to say that in circumstances where the silver was destined partly for Egyptian coin and partly for Union coin, he would have held, applying the so uh, Parliament bill, as I've already said, that it was used substantially for government purposes, and that was sufficient. Uh, uh, and we submit, I, I know I'm on the facts, but I'm going to just skip slightly out of the facts into the Parliament bill, if, if I may do, in the light of the questions that were raised earlier, that the judge's approach that he would have taken if he hadn't been against us on in use, was the correct approach. And for that purpose, if we could go to divide a four um, of the authorities bundle, uh, the judgment of the Court of Appeal in, in Parliament Belge, and turn to page 55. Um, this was um, an action against the ship, a ship owned by uh, the King of the Belgians and crewed by uh, officers commissioned by him. She was engaged on predominantly sovereign purposes, but was also carrying some passengers uh, uh, or trade purposes. Um, and and uh, in, in the Court of Appeal, uh, Lord Justice Brett, at page 55, um, uh, just um, about 10 lines in, um, a, a passage beginning to implead an independent sovereign. Uh, says as follows, to implead an independent sovereign in such a way as to call upon him to sacrifice either his property or his independence. Please, so, so, it's my fault. Where, where, which page are we at? Page 55 of the bundle, my lord. Internal page 219 of the report. Thank you. For those working in paper just above the top punch hole. Thank you. Uh, to implead an independent sovereign in such a way as to call upon him to sacrifice either his property or his independence. 
to place him in that position is a breach of the principle upon which the immunity from jurisdiction rests. We think he cannot be so direct, indirectly impeded any more than he could be directly impeded. Um, that, that goes to the adjudicative stroke enforcement distinction, so far as there is one. Um, but then, uh, for relevant purposes, the next paragraph. But it is said that the immunity is lost by reason of the ship having been used for trading purposes. As to this, it must be maintained either that ship has been so used as to have been employed substantially as a mere trading ship. So that's option one. There's so much trade involved that it's substantially a trading ship and not substantially a national ship. Or the use of her in part for trading purposes takes away the immunity, although she is in possession of the sovereign authority by the hands of commissioned officers. So what the Court of Appeal is saying there is that if you're going to take away immunity because there's been some trading activities, then you've either got to say any trading activity away the immunity or even a little trading activity. And that is dealt with over the page at uh, page uh, 56. Um, uh, and again, if I can pick up two parts, um, almost halfway down the page in the right hand side, the words if the, so if the remedy sought by an action in rem against public property is, as we think, an indirect mode of exercising the authority of the court against the owner of the property, then the attempt to exercise such an authority in an attempt inconsistent with the independence and equality of the state which is represented by such owner. The property cannot, upon the hypothesis, be denied to the public property, to be public property. The case is within the terms of the rule, it's within the spirit of the rule. Therefore, we are of the opinion that the mere fact of the ship being used subordinately and partially for trading purposes does not take away the general immunity. Now, uh, my, my lords, the, the Parliament Bell has a little bit of a check of history because, because the head note refers to absolute immunity. Uh, there were a number of cases um, uh, after the Parliament Bell that cited it as authority for the absolute theory of immunity. But again, uh, we, we may need to, for this purpose, look at Lord Sumter and Ben Carbouche, I hope not. Uh, but he analyses the old cases and actually concludes that the Parliament Bell was a restricted theory case. And indeed, the passages I've just taken my lords to make it clear that the Parliament Bell from Admiralty Action Against the Ship was applying essentially the restricted theory. They were asking themselves the question what kind of trading activity is going on and how significant is it? And does that take away the immunity? So the Parliament Belge, as uh, the Privy Council concluded in the um, Philippine Admiral case, which we will have to look at later, um, is in fact a restricted um, theory case. And the test is whether the ship is being used subordinately or partially for trading purposes. And that is not sufficient to take away the immune nature of the, part of, uh, of the ship. And we say that exactly the same applies in relation to a cargo. If you have a cargo that is sovereign, silver for the purposes of minting coins, it remains sovereign, even if there is some trading purpose towards it, provided that the trading is subordinate or partial. So where the learned judge has concluded that the greater part of the silver was going to be used for union coins, any use for Egyptian coins is, we submit, subordinate and partial and does not take away the immunity that silver generally enjoys. A and again, a, a similar test um, is in the uh, uh, advice of the Privy Council, uh, which my lords have in tab six of the authorities bundle, uh, page 392 of the report, page 97 um, of my lords bundle. Um, the test um, set there um, is that it is necessary to consider, and this is referring back to the Parliament Belge, whether the ship is being used, quote, it's, um, between letters C and D at page 97, ship is being used, quote, substantially for public purposes. And so again, where the greater part of the cargo was to be used for union coins, the cargo was being used substantially for sovereign purposes. Um, we say. And the, the reason I've um, taken my lords um, to um, that, that authority or those authorities is because uh, at first instance, the claimant argued that because the production of union coinage might generate a profit, that that should be treated as a commercial purpose. Um, I don't believe that argument is renewed on the appeal. There's nothing in the respondent's notice that said we should um, lose the claim to immunity, come what may, because we were going to generate a profit on the union coinage. So we don't need to go into the evidence in relating to that issue. But it is argued, and was argued, that the use of some of the coin for producing Egyptian coin is the commercial purpose, and that's why I've taken my lords to the Parliament Belge and, and to the Philippine Admiral to uh, submit that that is not sufficient to unknown the claim. A, a, a smaller part of the cargo 
does not deprive it of its sovereign nature. Uh, how would you be making a profit if it were used for union coinage? I don't quite understand that. Um, <coughs> I know it's not your argument, but I don't understand it. Um, it. Essentially, the cost of the silver to the mint and the overheads of producing the coin was less, less than, than the face, the value, face of the value of the coins that were produced. Um, and there was a lot of evidence about this, which I, I say I don't believe we need to go into because there's no respondent's notice saying that union coins is a commercial purpose. Um, but there was evidence about the fact that if a profit was made, the profit was ploughed back into the mint by being put into a fund for recoining worn out coins and any balance was put into the national fund. Um, but, but the point that is taken against me is that the Egyptian coin, um, which would generate um, some profit, um, was a, a commercial purpose. And, I, and I've made my position as clear as I can possibly in relation to that. You, you, you don't take issue with that as a proposition. You simply say it, it was, on the judge's findings, only a smaller part and therefore legally irrelevant. It, it, indeed. Uh, if we were to go behind that, there are submissions to make about how much profit would be made, and there are factual issues that arose in front of the judge that are not for, for my lords today. Um, uh, and I'll see how well Ernest Flynn puts his case on this. But we say that the judge's finding of the greater part is sufficient to dispose of this argument. Um, if it were not, it may be necessary to look at what was going to happen to the profit from the non union coinage, because that also was going to be ploughed back into the mint through various different routes. But, my lord, we rest our case on the finding of substantially a commercial purpose. And so the order, just because we need to look at the contracts that the judge thought was significant, if I can just deal with that, the order for the silver uh, was placed in October uh, 1942. Um, that's pages 238 and 239 um, of, of, of the supplementary bundle. We, we don't need to turn up uh, those pages at this stage. And it was to be delivered in the course of October 1942 and February 1943 in three consignments. Uh, the order was revised on the 6th of October 1942 and confirmed on the 4th of uh, November. And originally, as I said, there were to be three consignments. Um, the terms of the order uh, were those that had been agreed for previous orders of silver from the Indian government. So they were FOB terms. Um, there was, as the judge said at paragraph 27 of the judgment, no direct evidence as to the terms of the contract of carriage. Uh, but we accepted that it was probable, looking at all the evidence, that the contract was arranged in India, but on behalf of the Union government, with the Union being the party. So it was made on, on behalf of the Union. In the event the first two consignments were merged and shipped as one, they were dispatched from the Bombay Mint on the 17th of November 1942 and shipped on board Talawa. Payment for the freight um, had been made in India in rupees, and a, a demand for um, that to be uh, paid by the government of South Africa was made on the 19th of November. That's page 251 of the bundle. And the Union government made the relevant payment on the 2nd of December. That's page 252. And it paid, essentially, the price <coughs> of the silver and the freight, which had been paid on its behalf earlier, uh, on the 2nd of December, 1942. But in the meantime, Talawa had tragically been sunk by enemy action. The um, order for Egyptian coins had been placed earlier in the year for 10 million two piastre coins. Um, that had been placed earlier in 1942. That's paragraph 33 of the judgment. And the government's, uh, the Mint's original intention had been to produce this coin in, in June and July. But that had been delayed because of the need to order forging. And the judge concluded, and we do not challenge, that it was improbable that the Egyptian coinage had been produced by September 1942. So that's paragraph 43. But he also uh, observed that there was evidence that the Egyptian coin was, in the end, minted from other silver, so not the silver that was lost and not the silver that formed part of that consignment. That was paragraph uh, 40. Um, uh, in fact, the claimant um, accepted before the judge that the, the Egyptian coin was all minted in 1942. That's recorded at paragraph 42 of the judgment. And that means it must have been minted without recourse to the silver subject to the order that my lords are concerned with. Because the order was placed, the two thirds, first two thirds were lost. In fact, what happened is the final one third of the order that my lords are concerned with was dispatched on the 30th of December from India. So it clearly hadn't arrived in South Africa in time to be used in 1942. Uh, that's page 276 of the supplemental bundle. And the lost silver was replaced by two shipments made in February and March. 
So what we can deduce from that, um, page 276, 277 of the bundle, is that none of the silver was subject to the order, so the FOB contract that the judge was concerned with, was in the event used for the Egyptian coinage, because the coinage was all produced in 1942. The silver under that contract didn't arrive until 1943. And there was evidence, as the judge observed at paragraph 42 of the judgment, that during 1942 as a whole, roughly 20% of the silver used at the mint was used for Egyptian coins. And so that, no doubt, is where the judge got his greater than, greater part or significant part. So I don't think we can say directly 80-20, but the evidence is there that roughly 20% of all the silver used in 1942 was used for silver, uh, for the Egyptian coin, 80% used for Union coin. And so by the 2nd of December, the purchase price and the freight had been paid. So the Union had discharged all of its obligations under both of the contracts that the judge regarded as being relevant for the purposes of assessing in use or intended use of the commercial coin. And that's the point I derive and ask my lords to note from that brief canter to the facts that the, all of the Union's obligations under those contracts, insofar as it had entered into the commercial contract, had been discharged by the Union by the 2nd of December 1942. Which is post casualty, because the freight wasn't paid until after that. That's certainly what the judge found in paragraph 26. It was not paid by the government, so we didn't reimburse those in India who had paid the freight. The only reason I'm hesitating is I think it may actually have been paid to the ship owner um, earlier in November, because that's why I took my loss to the fact that demand. But certainly the I government see. didn't pay anything until the 2nd of December, so it's, it's after the casualty. Um, and the silver remained um, on the seabed until 2017. Um, Argentum located the silver and entered into a contract uh, with AMS to recover the silver. Uh, and that recovery work was carried out by the seabed worker, which was in turn chartered in by AMS from her owners. <coughs> it was recovered in stages until the 23rd of June 2017. From the 23rd of June till the 2nd of August, seabed worker carried out other work in, in the Indian Ocean. She departed for the Cape of Good Hope on the 2nd of August. The silver was transshipped on board the Pacific Ascari on the 3rd of September, and the claimant's evidence is that that took place within the South African contiguous zone. Um, that's paragraph 25 of a witness statement, which my laws have at tab 2 of the supplementary bundle. We don't need to turn it up. I think it's common ground. And it's that fact that gives rise to our allegation that the silver should have been declared to the South African authorities, and therefore to the Article 18 point about misconduct by the South. That is, of course, for another day, not, not for today. The silver arrived in the United Kingdom on the 2nd of October, and that's why my learned friend says his cause of action approved then. It was declared to the receiver of wreck, and it has been held to her order ever since. Of course, one of the significances of the fact that the silver is held to the order of the receiver of wreck is that the claimant has only had to issue its claim form um, against the thing. It hasn't had to apply to serve the claim. Well, I think it has served the claim form now, but it hasn't applied for the arrest or detention of, of, of the silver. It hasn't need to. But in any other case, uh, and to come back uh, to my Lord, Lord Justice Popwell's point about we need to consider the significance of this judgment for other salvage cases, in any normal salvage case where the cargo um, has been salved and brought to a place of safety, it would not be declared to the receiver of wreck, and therefore the salvor would have to arrest as well as simply invoke the jurisdiction against the thing uh, in, in order to maintain its claim. Um, and, and then just fi finishing the, the chronology uh, very briefly, because um, I think my lady already made, made the point on this, um, we didn't uh, form any intention as to the use um, of the silver until after the 2nd of October uh, 2017, so after the cause of action had accrued on any basis. Um, we acknowledged issue of the claim form, as I've said, pursuant to uh, Part 61.36, which permits an interested party to acknowledge uh, the service of the claim form, even though they've not been served, and made this application for the purposes of challenging jurisdiction. So uh, those are, uh, we, we submit, uh, something of a canter, but I don't think any of it's a serious dispute. Uh, the relevant facts that un underline this dispute, I'll, I'll come back to them uh, as necessary. So, as I said, before turning to our five grounds of appeal. Um, can I ask 
is my lord intending a break for the transcriber or are we going no. to no I can't see a transcriber that needs a break and um, they've got technological means to keep up I would check before I tell them my lord. Um, so my lord um, moving on then and I said I would deal with two headline points of the law in relation to state immunity which we say um, are relevant to all of the individual grounds um, and the, the first of those is to look at uh, the role of customary international law and the uh, evidence of state practice that was available to the judge in relation to customary international law. A as I've said, it's common ground that English law applies the restrictive theory, and that requires the court to ascertain whether the proceedings in which immunity is claimed relate to a commercial or a sovereign act. Um, we've um, looked at uh, the Premier Congresso if I could ask my lords briefly on that to turn up at page you either seven of your party's bundle, the judgment of the Court of Appeal in Prentex, and in particular a brief passage from Lord Justice Shaw at page 157 of the bundle. Uh, where Lord Justice Shaw says, I'm content to say top of the page, letter A, that it convinces me that the preponderant contemporary rule of international law supports the principle of qualified or restrictive immunity, which takes account not only of the sovereign status of the party, but also the nature of the transaction in respect of which the issue of immunity arises. So again, to reprise the, the theme earlier, you are looking at the nature of the transaction in respect of which the claim to immunity arises. This reflects uh, what I quoted, the quotes from Lord Wilberforce and Lord Bridge earlier. The 1978 Act, as I've said, is intended to reflect and implement the restrictive theory, and it's mainly concerned with immunity from the adjudicative jurisdiction of the court, as we've seen. Section 1 provides the default position, sections 2 to 11 provide... Sorry, I'm, you're, you're dropping your voice. I'm sorry, my Lord. extremely fast. So perhaps... I'll slow I thought down. you were still reading from Trentex, but apparently you're making a submission. You need to make it again if you want me to write it down or even understand it. My Lord, I do apologise. I had finished reading from Trentex, yes. and the point I was making was that um, Lord Justice Shaw in Trentex is proposing a very similar approach to that which I mentioned earlier, Lord Bridge and Lord Wilberforce in the Premier Congresso, which is that one needs to look at the nature of the transaction in respect of which the uh, issue of immunity arises. We say that precisely reflects the restrictive theory as applied as a matter of customary international law. Uh, we also submit to my lords that in construing the sections of the Act that contain the exceptions from immunity, it's appropriate, if necessary, for the court to, firstly, or necessary for the court to give words their ordinary meaning, and secondly, in cases of ambiguity, to have regard to principles of customary international law. And I suspect that is not a controversial proposition. If authority is needed, um, Dickinson on state immunity in the, the authorities bundle at tab 30. We accept, and it's important I should make this clear at the outset, we accept that insofar as section 3 or any of the other sections of the Act do not properly reflect the restrictive theory then any grant of immunity pursuant to those sections would necessarily be disproportionate so as to engage, as the respondents say, human rights um, considerations. But we uh, submit, and that, that's in the respondents' notes, uh, and that formulation simply restates the converse of what the Grand Chamber said in uh, al Adzani, quoted by Lord Sumption in Ben Carbush at paragraph 22, uh, measures taken by a high contracting party which reflect generally recognised rules of public international law and state immunity cannot in principle be regarded as imposing a disproportionate restriction. So there are two sides of the same coin. If the national law reflects customary international law, it's not disproportionate. If it isn't, it doesn't, it is. And that's why I'm stressing to my lords and my lady that Section 10 and Section 13 by focusing on the commercial use as against the sovereign use of the property, reflect and implement the restrictive theory, and therefore no issues um, of disproportionality and human rights um, issues arise. So 
if we're right, we don't need to go there on, on those issues raised in the respondents' notice. And that's in contrast uh, to Ben Carbouche, uh, which I think it may be useful just to, to, to look at uh, briefly at this stage. It's in the authorities bundle at tab 17. Tab 17. In Ben Carbouche, uh, the court was concerned with issues relating to contracts of employment. And in particular, with section 42B and 16.1 of the Act. And the conclusion was <coughs> that because 42B allowed the issue of immunity to be determined, at least in part, based on the nationality of the claiming party, of the employee, and Section 16 allowed immunity to be determined simply by whether they were employed in the diplomatic mission, without regard to whether they were actually involved in any meaningful way in sovereign acts, meant that those two sections did not reflect the restrictive theory, um, uh, uh, and therefore, as I've said, um, were disproportionate. And we get that from the conclusion um, of Lord Sumption, in particular, um, for example, at paragraph 65, page 824 of the judgment, page 397. Um, and I just, this is the clearest place, perhaps, where it's stated, but it's stated on a number of occasions, paragraph 65. Like Section 4 of the Act, Article 5 of the Convention, this is referring to the European Convention, deals with contracts of employment without reference to the distinction between um, acts of a sovereign nature and acts of a commercial nature. And that is the key to why Section 4 was disproportionate, because it didn't reflect the restrictive theory. And that's why we don't get into issues of disproportionality. So our case is not that there is a specific rule of customary international law which precisely reflects Section 10.4. We don't need to establish that. We only need to establish that Section 10.4 is consistent with the restrictive theory. It doesn't go beyond it. Um, and if I could ask um, to turn to tab 37 of the authorities bundle briefly, the Empire of Iran case. I wish that. 37, my lord. Page 811 of the bundle pagination. Um, just um, below halfway, you can see the uh, margin um, uh, line, uh, the number three, the qualification of state. Eight, 811, internal page 80. There's a number, it's a, uh, the headlining starts in the left hand side, just below, halfway down the page. You see the number three, the qualification of state activity as sovereign or non-sovereign, must in principle be made by national municipal law, since international law at least usually contains no criteria for the distinction. So we rely on that as authority for the proposition that it is for the English Act to define exactly where the dividing line is between commercial activity and sovereign activity, but provided it draws that dividing line, in contrast to Section 4 that we just looked at in Ben Bush, it is consistent with and reflects the restrictive theory. This, this is a first instance decision of a judge in the German Federal Constitutional Court. Is that right? um, my, my lord, yes. Um, yes, obviously. But nonetheless, but none, but nonetheless I, I, you, you adopt that by way of submission. I adopt that one by way of submission and, and by way of reflecting uh, it, customary uh, international law that, that that issue, the issue of the distinction between sovereign and commercial, is left to, to national courts. Can you see that? 
uh, as I'm reminded by uh, Mrs. Wells, uh, as an explanation as to how international law works in, in, in relation to this, this issue. So you have the headline point, sovereign or commercial, and then the fine dividing line is, is for national law. Um, but even though we don't have to go so far in our submission as to say that there is a positive rule of customary international law which supports our case, as long as section 10.4 is consistent with the restrictive theory on our interpretation. Nonetheless, we do say that it is um, useful to look at the evidence that was before the, the learned judge of, of state practice, which consists of um, a number of um, legislation from a number of states, some relevant national court decisions, the drafting history of the United Nations Convention, and the United Nations Convention um, itself, as well as the Salvage Convention. I'm going to tick off the Salvage Convention first because I've already looked at that. The Salvage Convention simply gives immunity where it is given by customary international law, and it gives it both for adjudicative and enforcement in REM proceedings. Um, if I could ask um, the court to go forward in the authorities bundle, and I'll take this as quickly as I can because I don't think there are any serious disputes about this. I'm going to start with the United States Act. Um, at tab. Sorry, just before you leave the salvage convention, um, is it your case that um, it was no immunity under the 1978 Act, nevertheless under the provision of the Merchant Shipping Act that gives effect to the salvage convention, there is immunity? I'm not quite sure in my own mind to what extent you what purpose you're seeking to derive, to derive assistance from section 25 of Article 5 of the Salvage Convention? If I can take that in two stages. Um, firstly, it is conceptually possible, but unlikely, and we don't contend for this, that a claim would arise under Article 25 that didn't arise under Section 10. So if we could establish a principle of customary international law that said we were immune, and if Section 10 has the limited meaning, for example, ascribed to it by the judge, the judge were right, and of course we submit he was not. Dropping your voice again. Sorry, I do apologize. If Section 10 has the meaning ascribed to it by the judge, i.e. you have to look at the contract in 1942 to determine the use of the cargo, 1943, then conceptually it is possible that a claim for immunity arises under Article 25 if we're right as to what customary international law says, even though it doesn't under Section 10, but that would be a surprising conclusion in our submission, because if we were right under Article 25, that would be further support for why the judge was wrong on Section 10. So it's conceptually <coughs> possible, but we don't contend for this. But and Article you don't, as I recorded your submission earlier, don't suggest that customary international law positively requires immunity, which would what you'd have to what you'd have to assert in order to come within Article 25. As I recall in your submission, is you don't need to go so far as and don't say that there is a rule of customary international law which would provide immunity in this case. You simply say that your interpretation of the State Immunity Act is consistent with customary international law. Indeed. Although, as I'm going to go on to, to show my lord, we do uh, submit that based on the, such evidence there is as to state practice, that supports the submission that under customary international law we would be immune so as to invoke Article 25. But my submission earlier related to Section 10, that for Section 10 purposes, I don't need to go so far as to, uh, as to establish a rule of customary international law. Well, that's why I was pressing you. Are you saying there is a customary rule of international law which can get you home on Article 25? Well, my Lord, I know for this reason we don't accept that we have to show that there is a rule requiring it, simply that we are entitled to immunity um, in accordance with, and so that immunity would not offend customary international law insofar as there is evidence of that. Is that right under the wording of Article 25? Second 
statutory condition entitled at the time of the service operations to sovereign immunity under generally recognised principles of international law. Well, my Lord, what we would submit in relation to that is that if we are entitled to immunity under Section 10.4, and again, this probably comes back to the same point, we're entitled to immunity uh, because Section 10.4 is not engaged, um, then we are entitled to immunity under English law, which reflects customary international law, and therefore Article 25 would be engaged as well. I didn't follow that. I'm afraid I didn't. Right, my Lord. You have to say it much more slowly if it's a real submission. I mean, what my Lord's asking you is pretty clear, isn't it, because of the terms of Article 25. So we need a yes or no. I mean, maybe we should look at your skeleton. What do you say in your skeleton about Article 25 and its applicability? Should I have a look at it? Um, my Lord, I think we deal with Article 25 um, very briefly. Um, right, so let's, let's in, try not to, to make up submissions on the hoof, as it were. My, my Lord, Mr. Smith. Because Mr. Hofmeyer's got to deal with them. And he'd like to know what they are as much as we would. You mentioned 25. Um, the government's case is that it's entitled to immunity in accordance with the uh, 78 Act and or Article 25. That's paragraph 7. My, my Lord, yes. And at, at, at round 4, um, we submit in relation to customary international law that it provides for the restrictive theory of immunity. Um, so essentially, if applying the restrictive theory of immunity we are entitled to immunity, then Article 25 is engaged as well. And it comes back to the same point as the Empire of Iran point. So let, let me start the point, um, if, if, if I can, again. Can, can I just have a moment, my Lord? I, I, I fear I may, by responding to my Lord on um, too quickly, unnecessarily made the point more complicated. So if I can start again to be clear. The relevant rule of customary international law is to apply the restrictive theory. If applying the restrictive theory we are entitled to immunity, then we engage Article 25 because that is the relevant rule of international I don't have to go any further and establish that there's a relevant rule of international law, that the dividing line is in any particular place between sovereign and commercial actors. Because the dividing line where that is drawn is a matter for national law. And that is, by which I mean the conclusion that that is a matter for national law, that is a matter international law, which is why I took my law. Well, if it's a matter of national law, how can it go beyond Section 10? Because if the state asking itself whether immunity exists applies domestic law to the question of whether it's commercial or sovereign, the state has applied the restrictive theory, which is the rule under customary international law, and therefore it's answered the question for the purposes of Article 25 as well as for the well, it's just a question of construction of commercial and sovereign in the Act, which, which brings into play, you say, customary international law, if necessary, insofar as appropriate. Um, my Lord, yes, but also for the purposes of Article 25, that because the rule that we is common ground between the parties is the rule of customary international law to apply the restrictive theory, provided the court has applied the restrictive theory and got the answer immune, then that engages Article 25 as well as Section 10. But conceptually, you can get home on immunity on one or the other, because Article 25 is given domestic statutory, direct statutory effect by the relevant provision. I've forgotten the number in the Merchant Shipping Act. And so, uh, which is why I was pressing you initially, which, on whether which, you said you can get home under Article 25 and you can't get home under 
Well, my lord, uh, under Section 10, I should perhaps have resisted the temptation um, to, to engage in what was conceptually possible and made it clear that our case is that the two go essentially hand in hand together. Yeah. I don't advance a positive case for immunity under Section 25 if I've lost on Section 10. Thank you. And I apologise for not resisting the temptation to point out that that might have been conceptually possible. Well, just to be absolutely clear, I have written down that you do not advance a separate case under Article 25 if you don't get home on Section 10. It, it, to be strictly correct, it should be Section 1 as affected by Section 10, but yes, my Lord, that's correct. Yes. So the rule of customary international law is, is the restrictive rule. And the evidence as to state practice which we uh, rely on, uh, goes to a number of factors. In particular, the judge's conclusion in a number of places in his judgment that it would be surprising if we were immune uh, when one applied uh, the restrictive <coughs> theory. So, my Lord, I do, do want to go, if I may, just very briefly through um, the, the foreign uh, legislation. Um, and starting with the United States Act, um, which was originally in my Lord's bundle at tab 40, um, there's been a, a revision at tab 49 um, and so the, the relevant um, amended provision is at tab 49 beginning at page 937 and at, at the beginning of the, U the United States Code section um, or the part of the United States Code dealing with this um, if I can just uh, refer uh, the court to the Currentness comments on paragraph 1602. Congress finds that the determination. Well, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but so, so do I understand that we're now going to these um, examples, uh, not for the purposes of your submitting that they establish a customary rule of international law, but as examples of other jurisdictions in which the result would be the same as that for which you contend, so as to blunt, as it were, the judge's suggestion that it would produce a surprising result. Indeed, that, that's in, it, indeed my lord. And right. insofar as necessary, uh, so as to rebut any suggestion that our construction of section 10.4 goes beyond the restrictive theory so as to engage any issues of disproportionality and human rights act. So, 1602. 1602. Congress finds that the determination by United States courts of claims for foreign states to immunity from the jurisdiction of such courts would serve the interests of justice and would protect the rights of both foreign states and litigants in the United States courts. And then, uh, particularly relevantly, under international law, states are not immune from the jurisdiction of foreign courts insofar as their commercial activities are concerned and their commercial property may be levied for the satisfaction of judgments rendered against them in connection with their commercial activity. So we see a distinction there between essentially adjudicative uh, jurisdiction in relation to commercial activities and enforcement jurisdiction in relation to commercial property. Um, and that is then uh, reflected in, in the substantive provisions. If we turn forward to 938, commercial activity means um, letter D I apologise, this has not been sidelined, but it was only added very recently when we realised... I'm afraid you've lost me. I'm sure it's my fault. But 938, uh, my lord, a little d... Page 938. I didn't have a 938. Uh, uh, we I haven't got tab 49. I think it's probably only in the electronic. In the electronic. Um, I, I, do, I don't have a tab 49, I'm afraid. No, I don't either, but it's I'm just the looking for it in the electronic. For, for, for your net. Um, do you have... Could I take it then... Um, no, I can, I can find it. Yeah, um, find it on no, we have it earlier. It's, it's the new but the new version of the authorities bundle, which you had to download overnight to get this. I'm not sure I, don't I had so understood, I'm afraid, and I apologise. We can read it to you because it's very simple. It says, 1603, Article 1603 says, for the purposes of this chapter, little d, 
a commercial activity means either a regular course of commercial conduct or a particular commercial transaction or act. And then you may want the next sentence, which says the commercial character of an activity shall be determined by reference to the nature of the course of conduct, the particular transaction or act, rather than by reference to its purpose. I'm very, I'm very grateful, my lord. Which um, is fascinating and no doubt could spark a debate for some hours, Mr. Smith. Well, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. No, and what, what is the document from which, 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 which we which we're reading? This is the, the this is the draft. No, this is of the United the States Code. This is United the draft. This is the amended oh. version. So we have the United States Code in tab forty. Um, 40. 40. This is the United. I'm with you now. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hoffmeyer kind of reminds me that the definitions are the same. Uh, in fact, the changes are minimal, but I thought it appropriate to go to the more up to date. We can find it in 40. Right. Yeah. But the, in 40. So if, if those with the old paper bundle, it's, it's all in tab 40, but I thought it more. I ought to go to the more up to date version. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Don't worry. I'll catch up. It's on page 828. Yeah. 828. Um, and then um, relevantly, at page 829, um, in relation to ad ad admiralty jurisdiction, um, B, a foreign state shall not be immune from the jurisdiction of the courts of the United States in any case in which a suit in admiralty is brought to enforce a maritime lien against a vessel or cargo of the foreign state, which maritime lien is based upon a commercial activity of the foreign state. And so, the reason for taking the Lords to this is to show a very similar approach to that we saw Lord uh, Bridge and Lord Wilberforce, that there needs to be a nexus between the commercial activity of the foreign state and the maritime lien that gives rise to the admiralty claim in, in rem against the vessel. Can you just say that again, Mr Smith? Um, the Slowly. I apologise. So the United States Act yes. requires uh, that for there to be no immunity, the claim should be one to enforce a maritime lien against the vessel or cargo of the foreign state. Yeah. Which maritime lien is based on a commercial activity of the foreign state? Yeah. So uh, that is reflecting uh, the passages I took the court to from the Premier Congresso, Lord Bridge and Lord Wilberforce where there had to be a nexus, as I submitted earlier this morning, yeah. between the activity of the foreign state and the cause of action of the party seeking to bring the claim. So here, to be entitled to pursue the maritime claim um, against, the re against the thing, the claim has to have a maritime lien, which has to be based on the commercial activity of the foreign state. So very similar to the passages we looked at earlier, where there had to be a relationship between the cause of action that the claiming party was seeking to enforce against the state and the commercial activity. And you say a lien for salvage wouldn't have the correct nexus? Unless there was a salvage contract, which would be the commercial yeah. activity entered into by the, by the state. Well, if there's a salvage contract, you don't need an action against the thing anyway. In, indeed. Quite. So in practical terms, it's, it, it's meaningless. Because in practical terms, it wouldn't arise. If you've got a salvage contract, you don't need an action against the thing. Um, so the only circumstances in which an action against the thing would arise are where you wouldn't need one. Um, well, this is dealing with other actions as well as salvage, my lady, and so forth. Well, well, I thought we were agreed that, there yes. was, that a maritime lien wouldn't arise in any other circumstances other against, than salvage. Against the cargo, uh, in, indeed, certainly as a matter of English law. Yeah. Um, so um, that is the position um, we submit uh, under United States law. We would be um, I I immune looking at the requirement for the. I mean, one wonders how far this gets you, really. Are we going to other um, national laws now? Um, very briefly. Because, um, I mean, I'm just. The reason I, I ask is that if Mr. Hoffmeyer's case is uh, that it is, it would be surprised. Um, and that he can show that other laws are in his favour, then that might be something for him to 
to go to, but for you simply to show a, a range of national laws that show that it's not surprising is um, seemingly unnecessary. Um, in, in which case, um, can I ask uh, the court to turn um, very briefly just to two of the acts which are specifically relevant to the issue that we have to concern with, and I won't go through all the others. Um, uh, and that is for this reason. Um, there is an issue as to whether there is a third category between in use and intended for use where a cargo is not in use. Uh, our submission is simple that under the wording of the Act, if the cargo is in use, that is what the court looks at. If the cargo is not in use, the court looks at the intended for use. And if there is no commercial use and no commercial intended use, then the cargo is sold. My learned friend says um, that there's no third category of not in use. And two of the acts have grappled with that specific point. And I just want to, to show uh, the, the court those acts, um, if I may. Um, and, and then to show uh, the court the United States Convention, uh, sorry, the United Nations Convention, which also deals with the same point of what happens. Um, and this perhaps goes back to my lady's point earlier about the cargo not being in use at all if it's at the bottom sea. Mm. What happens in relation to cargoes that are not in use? So I'm not going to go to any of the other foreign legislation at this stage. Um, I'll save that for reply if necessary. But I do need to go, if I may, briefly to the Australian um, Act, which is in tab 46. page 884 um, and it's the definitions section at page 906 so the Australian Act applies broadly the same principle as the English Act but in relation to execution against commercial um, it provides as follows. Uh, this is section 32. Uh, subsection 2, where the foreign state is not immune in proceedings um, against or in connection with a ship, section 30 does not prevent the arrest, detention or sale of the ship if at the time of the arrest or detention the ship or cargo was commercial property in the case of a cargo that was being carried on a ship belonging to the state, uh, belonging to the same or some other foreign state, the ship was commercial. But then relevantly, section 32, subsection 3, B, property that is apparently vacant or not in use shall be taken to be uh, used for commercial purposes unless the court is satisfied that it has been set aside otherwise than for commercial purposes. So that essentially creates a presumption of commerciality where the property is not in use. And we say that is a different drafting approach to the definition of in use or intended for use than under the English Act. Well, it is, and it's... it's, it's um, different in a sense that is unhelpful to you? Well, with, with res respect, my lady, no, because um, it would still be necessary if we were to say there is a non-commercial purpose. We would still look at the non-commercial purpose. But the starting point under the Australian Act... Is, is a presumption that it's commercial. Is a presumption that it's commercial. But that is helpful to us because there's no such presumption um, in the English Act and no such presumption in any of the other Acts. Um, there is a similar presumption. And we don't need to look at it, I'll just mention it, in the Israeli Act, which is a, a divide of 48. That's why your submission that it's all down to national law to draw the distinction between commercial and non-commercial is so important for you then. Because if it was a matter of international law, we'd see that other states seem to think that if it's um, uh, not in active use, but is connected with a commercial transaction, it's presumed to be for a commercial purpose, and therefore wouldn't be subject to immunity. So if you were looking at that international comity, it might well be said that that's the way that one would go. Well, uh, as I said, my lady, the only two acts that have that presumption is the Australian and the Israeli one. Um, our submission is, as my lady has just said, that it is a matter for domestic law where to draw the line. And what these um, other foreign statutes illustrate is that the, the English legislature had intended to draw the line by uh, the means of having a presumption 
it would, as a matter of drafting, be open to it. And that is not the approach that the 1978 Act takes. I have to say that I am troubled by the submission that it ought to be a matter for national law. No way to pull the line between whether something is commercial or non-commercial. Given that the international um, provisions seem to draw the difference, a distinction between an act of the state, which is a sovereign act, and a commercial act. Because you could have the potential for all sorts of uh, idiosyncrasies, if that were the case. Is, is it a consequence of the fact that there are some things on which international law hasn't reached a consensus? So that whilst you can say on one side of the line that there is a generally recognized principle international law at X, and on the other side of the line there is a generally recognized principle of international law as to Y, but in the middle there may be uh, principles on which there is not a sufficient consensus. So it, to that extent uh, it's a matter for national law because there is no internationally recognized principle of international law. I'm trying to rationalise what you say is, 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 uh, is the reason for what you say in the German Federal Court judgment. I was going to say, firstly, the, the German Federal Court judgment is, is very much along those lines in, in the Empire of Iran. Secondly, the, the rule is the restrictive rule, so you have to look at the difference between commercial um, and, and sovereign. Um, and, and it may well be that um, the reason why there is no rule of international law as to where that line is drawn is because there is no consensus. And so if there is no consensus, then by definition, there is no customary international law on that issue. So the customary international law is you must distinguish between commercial and sovereign. Um, but there is no established practice as to where that line is drawn. And therefore, there's no requirement as a matter of international law to draw it in a particular place. Because, as my Lord has said, there's no um, established practice in that respect. Is, is there any English law that says that it's a matter for national law? Or do we simply have to go back to the uh, German federal constitution court? What one? The reason I'm struggling um, to give my Lord an immediate answer to that is that because I had understood it to be common ground that that, that was the correct position as a matter of English law. But where well, the even, line even if it is common ground, I'd like to know why. Um, my Lord, could, could I, two o'clock is could I time revert that. to that specific okay. point at two o'clock? Because I, I, had, I, didn't, I haven't got an answer at my fingertips. And the reason yeah, I haven't yeah. is because it was common ground before the judge, and I think we say this in our appellant's notice. Um, that even though that was common ground, nonetheless the judge went wrong. It may be that something that Lord Sumption says in Ben Carpeche. That's, that's, that's where I was um, have another look at that. going to look, my Lord. But, but for these purposes, and we do say this in our appellate notice, that where it was accepted before the judge, that that was a matter for national law, because it's not part of um, customary international law. Um, but I, it, what I would like to, and again to revert to, to my latest point of in Sorry, just while I have it in mind, I, th I think your submission is that Mr. Justice Burnton in the AIC case recognised that third possibility of something not having a use at all in relation to the dormant bank account. Is that right? We would put it slightly differently to that. It's not a third category, that if something is dormant, then it is treated as being sovereign unless and until you form an intention to use it for commercial purposes. So we would not say that it was a third category. We would simply say that where there is no use and no intended use, then applying the two categories in the Act, if you've got no commercial use and you've got no commercial intention, then you are, are sovereign. And yes, that is the AIC. But, 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 but you can have no use for the government. Yes, in, indeed. And that was the point I was going to come back to or my latest point about cargo that is in no use, uh, to make the point that that is a concept that is well recognised um, we, we would respectfully suggest that. And we get that from the working um, 
before the uh, United Nations Convention. And this is in, if, if uh, those with paper bundles have the same as me, is in authorities bundle two. Um, the United Nations Convention is at tab 24. And the draft articles in relation to it and the commentary of the International Law Commission are at um, tab 25. The draft articles and the commentary are 1991, is that right? And the convention itself ultimately is 2004. And, and I think Lord Sumption, Ben Carbouche, said that the, the convention was a product of a long, drawn-out process um, by, by the commission. These were not the first draft articles, but the, the, these are the draft articles that immediately preceded um, the convention. And, and the relevant article in, in the convention, um, at page 615 of Divide 24, first of all, commercial transactions, so the equivalent of our section three. Um, if a state engages in a commercial transaction with a foreign national, natural, or juridical person, and by <coughs> virtue of the applicable rules of private international law, differences relating to that commercial transaction fall within the jurisdiction of another, a court of another state, the state cannot invoke immunity from that jurisdiction in a proceeding arising out of that um, commercial transaction. And that's um, broadly the, the equivalent of our Section 3. And then Article 16, ships owned or operated by a state. Um, and Article 16.1 at page 618. Unless otherwise agreed between the states concerned, a state which owns or operates a ship cannot invoke immunity from jurisdiction before the court of another state, which is otherwise competent in a proceeding which relates to the operation of that ship, if at the time the cause of action arose, the ship was in use for other than government non-commercial purposes. So that's the ship. And the uh, rel uh, provisions relating to cargo um, are at paragraphs 3 and 4, um, and particularly paragraph 4. Paragraph 3 says, unless otherwise agreed between the states concerned, the state cannot invoke immunity from jurisdiction before the court of another state, which is otherwise competent in a proceeding which relates to the carriage of cargo on board a ship owned or operated by that state. If at the time the cause of action arose, the ship was used for other than non-commercial purposes. So that's only concerned with the claim against the government ship. It's not concerned with the claim against the cargo. And then paragraph 3 does not apply to any cargo carried on board ships referred to in paragraph 2. So that's warships and such like. Nor does it apply to any cargo owned by a state and used or intended to use exclusively for government non-commercial purposes. So there is in fact no provision in Article 16 which would remove the exemption from immunity for a claim against a state-owned cargo. So th the state is going to be susceptible to jurisdiction against the state itself under Article 10, claim relates to a commercial transaction. But there's no provision in the UN Convention that removes the general immunity for a claim against the cargo. Something been, I've been thinking about, which may be a complete red herring, but it's just worth putting in your mind. Um, when does the state, or when does anybody, abandon a cargo um, that has um, been sunk. It, it's it's quite obvious that you wouldn't abandon a cargo that is wrecked on a on a sandbar. But um, does a, do, does an owner of a cargo is is an owner of a cargo at any stage taken to have abandoned it when it sinks three and a half kilometres in in 1942, which is completely unsalvageable for the foreseeable future. May be thought to be unsalvageable at that time ever. I will, I, I'm pausing before answering because I have not looked at the authorities on that point recently. But well, the only reason I'm asking it, it just it's a, maybe an interesting question in itself. But the reason I'm asking is that everybody in this case seems to have assumed 
that the question of use is use by the state. Use by the state, not use um, objectively, absolutely, by anyone. But that may raise the question of whether the cargo was abandoned by the state in 1942. And when you come to consider use by the by, you come to consider use, sorry, under Section 10 or whatever else, Article 25, in um, 2017, one might be considering use by a salvor, or uh, which would obviously be a commercial use. And um, nobody has uh, apparently considered use by anybody else. Now, it, it may be that because we're considering sovereign immunity here, that the only relevant use is use by the state. Uh, but um, I ask the question because it strikes me that it's not absolutely um, unquestionable that that's the case, since the Act doesn't say so. I, I, I would need to have a look, um, my Lord, before I give an answer. I'm fairly sure I know the answer, but it was a question that Mr. Justice Sheen, I think, considered in um, the Lusitania litigation in the context of a claim that the relevant cargo fell to the Crown. So it, it has been considered. And um, certainly, we, we, I remember looking at that point at an early stage in, in this, this case and concluded that that was... And then it, you concluded it was completely irrelevant and then moved on. Moved on. And it was never asserted against me that it was relevant. So, but I, I, again, if I may, at, at two o'clock, come back to that. You're going to have a lot to do in one and two. May I come back to that as far as necessary? Mr. Hoffmeyer is also pointing out that the judge touched on that issue in, in his judgment, so I'll have another look. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the point I was going to look at in, in the draft articles preceding the United Nations yes. was at page 668. 668. Yeah. Um, this is in relation to draft article 16, so the article that we've just been looking at. And in the context of in use or intended for use as applied to cargo, um, the, um, the Commission specifically looked at the issue my, my lady has raised, although not necessarily in the context of um, a cargo on the sea bed. And in paragraph 4, but the end of that paragraph, um, it should be noted that in paragraph 5, unlike in paragraphs 1, 2, and 4, the word words intended for use has been retained. So in relation to the ship, the words intended for use have been removed in the UN Convention. But in relation to cargo, the words intended for use are specifically left in place. That is because the cargo is not normally used while it's on board the ship, and therefore it's planned use which will determine whether the state concerned is or is not entitled to invoke immunity. So we pray um, that conclusion and the fact that then follows forward into the convention as um, uh, finalised, um, th those words still appear there, reflects the fact that it is recognised that a cargo is generally speaking not in use while it is on board the ship. And that is why you look at the intended use of the cargo. And, and, and that is why in our submission when one looks at the cases on enforcement and the foreign legislation in relation to enforcement, the focus is also on the intended use, where something is not in use. Uh, and that is why, to go back to my latest point, even with the Australian statute, which creates essentially a presumption of commerciality, you can still look at the intended use. And if the intended use is sovereign, the property is sovereign. And the same point, uh, and again, come back to the Australian Act, the same point was specifically considered um, by the draftsman of the Australian Act. And for that, if I could ask uh, the court to have um, 
the article that my learned friends have um, put in, um, Hepburn and Walpole, at tab 35 of the authorities bundle. This is a, 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 an article in which the learned judge's judgment was considered and the outcome under English law as held by the learned judge compared to the possible outcome under other systems of law. And if I could just ask the court to turn to tab 35, uh, to page 765. article are uh, looking at the position under um, Australian law and I'm picking up four paragraphs in the paragraph beginning applied to Argentum. Applied to Argentum the question would be whether the silver is properly characterised as a commercial cargo. The Australian Law Reform Commission in Foreign State Immunity 1984 report number 24 referred to the quote difficult point that cargo on a ship is not as such in use for any purpose. It recommended that cargo which is idle during the course of shipment ought to be regarded as in use for commercial purposes. And that's the point we've already looked at. But with a carve out that if the state could show that it was intended for sovereign purposes, that would trump. Um, and, and so the conclusion is that the last sentence of that paragraph, or the last two sentences, the Australian tax essentially deems a cargo to be a commercial cargo while being carried on a ship pursuant to a contract of carriage. Um, and the Foreign State Immunities Act is shrews the intended use inquiry. Well, as we've seen, it doesn't assure it completely because if you can show affirmatively a substantial commercial use, then that's sufficient. But what we see here is, again, the Australian draftsman is specifically recognising that a cargo on board a ship is not naturally described as being in use. And that you either therefore have to create a presumption, which is what the Australian Act does, or you have to look at the intended use, which is what the UN Convention I'm now a little confused. Reading this article, it rather suggests that, in Australia at least, there's the presumption that the idle cargo is regarded in, as in use for commercial purposes. And, as I understand it, under Australia, they don't look at its intended use. Well, uh, because that is thought to be productive of vagueness and uncertainty. So where do you get the carve-out that you could still say by looking at its intended use and showing that the dominant purpose is um, sovereign that uh, it, the presumption is disclosed? Um, from the Act itself, right. uh, my, my lady, which we looked at a while ago, which, just to remind, is tab 46 of the bundle. Right. At... Um, page 906, the very last words of section 32.3b, property that is apparently vacant or not. Unless the court is satisfied that it has been set aside otherwise than for commercial purposes. In, in, indeed. So well, that, cargo sitting on a ship is not set aside for any purpose. It's not been set aside at all. It's in transit. Well, so how could the court be satisfied it has been set aside for commercial purposes, other than for commercial purposes? Well, to give two examples, my lady, insofar as 1942 is relevant, which I'll come on to in a moment, we would say that it was clear that this cargo had been set aside for non-commercial purposes because it had been, um, to use the phrase that um, was used in some of the later cases, earmarked for use in the mint, to mint sovereign coins, and that would satisfy the set-aside that was the purpose for which it had been purchased. It was going to be used for sovereign purposes. Equally, if one were looking at the bank account cases, if one had accounts that was earmarked for use for commercial purposes, um, as in the one of the cases, I need to refresh my memory, but I'll come back to it if I may. But certainly, one of the bank account cases, the court was satisfied that the account was in use for commercial purposes because it had been earmarked uh, for that purpose. So you can earmark a, an account or property either for commercial or sovereign purposes, or that would satisfy, we would say, the set-aside test um, in that Australian statute. Mm. But the, the, the key point of, of, of this debate, my lady, again, just to go back, 
is that the English Act has not adopted that approach. It looks at in use or intended for use. You say consistently with the, with the draft of the Convention. Indeed. If it's not actually in use, you look at its intended use only. Absolutely. And um, if there is, if it's not in use and there is no intended use, which you say is not necessarily this case if you're looking at 1942, um, then it's sovereign because it's neither in use, it can't be shown that its intended use is commercial. So you, you look at things from the restrictive lens because the state has not bought its property into the marketplace. It is not trading in relation to its property. It's purchased its property in the marketplace, and I accept, for example, that if what was being considered was whether a claim could be bought by our account, by the union's counterpart under the sale contract, then that would engage Article 3, mm -hmm. um, subject to the fact that the counterpart was another state, so that brings different possible, um, aspects into consideration. And the contract of a freightman, the contract of carriage, that would be a commercial transaction uh, within Article 3. So we would accept that the, uh, if we were being, if the union was being sued on the contract <coughs> of a freightman, then there would be no um, immunity, because that is a commercial contract. But that's why it's different from the fact that we are not being sued on either of those contracts. They simply form part of the background, um, which is one of the phrases I think Lord Clark used in Savas that will come on to me. But, but again, just to, to recap... And always, and always would be part of the background in any case where the ship's being sunk. Then the contract of a freightment and the sale contract would always be part of the back background. But I think the ramifications of your argument, right or wrong, are, are that you could never claim salvage in REM in a situation such as this. In a situation such as this, where there is no um, salvage contract, yeah, and well, I don't once there's once there's a salvage contract, I think we've been round the houses on this already. Yeah. You don't need to bring an action against the thing. Um, there may be advantages in having the ability to do so, but in fact, you could bring an action uh, against the state anyway. Indeed, uh, and my lady, I don't shirk from that submission because that is exactly what Article Twenty Five of the Convention says which comes back to the, uh, one of the points I think my, my Lord Lord Justice Popperwell raised as to the relevance of the Convention. So irrespective of whether we invoke, we say there's a separate claim for immunity under the Convention, what the Convention does show is that the result we contend for is not surprising because the Convention grants immunity in relation to the in-rem proceedings, both adjudicative and enforcement. And so the, the, the result, as my lady has just postulated, it is not a, in our submission surprising. It reflects the convention. Um, uh, uh, and, and that indeed, um, I think, it neatly brings me to the point I was going to move on to, which is the distinction, as the judge saw it, between adjudicative and enforcement proceedings. Because as the court is aware, we rely significantly on the cases decided in the context of enforcement. And it is said against me, well, that's a different issue the court is only concerned with the in rem adjudicative proceedings or jurisdiction at this stage. Um, we accept, obviously, that adjudicative proceedings are, are in their nature different to enforcement proceedings. But as I mentioned earlier, claim in rem is a hybrid. And the reason why similar provisions apply in relation to adjudicative and enforcement is that a claim in REM allows the claimant to serve the thing, the cargo, and then move to judgment without ever serving the owner. And that is why it is important to bear that distinction in mind. Firstly, they can simply serve the thing. Secondly, they can then move to judgment if service is not acknowledged without any notice to the state at all. And that would enable, if there is in rem jurisdiction against the thing, uh, that would enable the claims essentially to circumvent 
what would otherwise be the strict requirements of Section 12 of the Act in relation to service on the state. So that is one important distinction between the claim against the person and the claim against the thing. Section 12 sets out the procedure in relation to service of the process. That becomes unnecessary if you can proceed uh, against uh, the cargo itself. And secondly, if there is no acknowledgement of service and the court does not, of its own motion, take the immunity point, in due course, if you've got a claim in, against the thing, you cede the judgment in default and to an application for appraisement and sale and secure payment of your claim in that manner. And so we do say that those are significant facets of the claim against the cargo that are not present when you are simply looking at other claims against the person of the Republic and are far closer to the considerations that apply where we are looking at an enforcement proceeding. Well, they're not, they're not are they in any way analogous to, to the execution of the jurisdiction? I understand the points you're making, but so far as the adjudicatory aspect of immunity is concerned, which is all that Section 10 is concerned with, what's special about in rem proceedings is one the service point you made and two which may be uh, aligned to it that you can establish territorial jurisdiction as of right in the location of the rem is raised um, which you which you couldn't otherwise do so in a sense the adjudicatory aspect of it, of immunity in in rem proceedings is, is all about jurisdiction not about liability as such. Indeed, and as the claim is a, is a hybrid, um, that is why in our submission the um, draftsman of the Act has applied the test in Section 10. That's, that's the bit I don't, I don't follow. It's a hybrid, but the adjudicatory aspect is dealt with in Section 10, and the execution aspect is dealt with in Section 13. And the mere fact that you can have both in the course of in rem proceedings isn't a problem because you apply them at different stages. You only apply uh, the execution aspects of immunity once the aspect of in rem proceedings which seeks uh, arrest or detention or sale uh, is sought, sought to be exercised. But that stage arises. Um, we would suggest of night follows day, where you have the ability to commence the proceedings against the cargo, serve the cargo without any notification required to the state, without any actual service on the, the potential personal defendant, and in the absence of an acknowledgement of service, proceed uh, to a judgment and to enforce, which will inevitably then engage the considerations that arise on the enforcement. And so the, the two are linked, the fact that you don't need to serve. And it, it, again, I skipped over it, but the, under the American Act, um, the proceeding against the thing, uh, where you are permitted to proceed against the thing, one of the provisions of the American Act is that you must give service to the state. And indeed, if you don't serve the state um, where you want to proceed, um, you, you can be liable for damages to the state. So, um, but essentially, um, I, I entirely see that you don't inevitably get to the enforcement stage, but the, in, the invoking the jurisdiction against the thing to start with is the first step down that path. And that is why we would suggest the draftsman has, and whether I'm right or wrong on that, the fact of the matter is that the draftsman has used exactly the same language in section 10 as in section 13, and the definition section in section 17 applies to both. Well, that's a stronger point because uh, you can say in relation to uh, the sections that it would be very curious if you didn't give the expressions uh, the same meaning both in section 13 and in section 10 when the identical language is used and the definitions are the same. That I entirely get. Well, I should perhaps have made that point first and then Second point, second, uh, my, my lady. Hindsight um, is a wonderful thing, Mr. Smith. Uh, but, but in any event, um, it is important that I don't lose sight of the point I made to start with to my, to 
my Lord Lord Justice Popperwell, the, the, the service provision is, is important as well, because that is the distinction between an admiralty claim against the person and all other invocation of the um, personal jurisdiction against um, a defendant that's engaged in commercial activity. Um, and, and, and so um, drawing those themes together, uh, we do submit to, to the court that in these circumstances, and it is, as my lady has just said, uh, necessary to consider the wording of Section 10, um, taking into account the decisions of the English courts in relation to Section 13, and that insofar as the judge took into account the fact that the court at this stage is only being asked to exercise a judicative jurisdiction, he attached too much weight to that point. And that's a point I'll come back to when I deal with the specific grounds of evidence there. So having looked at the role of international law and the distinction between adjudicative and enforcement proceedings, if I can then turn to the specific grounds on which we criticise the learned judge's judgment. And ground one is that the learned judge erred in concluding that when a cargo is sold under an FOB contract and shipped on board pursuant to a contract of carriage, contained in or evidenced by a bill of lading, it is, quote, in use for commercial purposes so as to engage section 10.4a. Firstly, this ground only arises if it's appropriate to look back to 1942 at all. And, and that's our ground three. I'll come on to deal with that. But the most important point, I think, is, is this one. Uh, on the assumption that it is appropriate to look back to 1942 and the two contracts made there. An overarching point in relation to this ground is with respect that on any basis it goes too far. If it were correct that a cargo purchased pursuant to a commercial contract or carried pursuant to a commercial contract of freight was not in use, then Section 10 could and would in our submission simply say so. It would not refer to in use or intended for use in commercial purposes. So would Article 25 of the Salvage Convention and the UN Convention and the equivalent sections of other legislation which I haven't taken my lords to, but which nonetheless set out similar provisions to the English Act. If those factors were determinative, it would be easy for the legislation to say so. But in fact, what the court is mandated to do by Section 17 is to look at the purpose. And Section 17 applies equally to the phrase commercial purpose used in Section 10 as in Section 13, which is my latest point that we've just um, looked at. And in one sense, that um, does involve looking at the history of the cargo. So what has been done with it, we would accept if things have been done with the cargo, you have to look at the history. The same as on the bank account cases, if the bank accounts have been used for commercial reasons, you have to look at the history. But you also need to look at what the state is planning to do with the asset in the future. And I uh, take that from uh, Lord Cross in uh, Privy Council, in the Philippine Admiral, if we can, um, in tab six of the Bundle of Authorities, Page 108, um, page 403 of the judgment. Um, at letter C, just above letter C, the question then arises whether the Philippine Admiral can properly be regarded as a mere trading vessel, or was at the relevant time, for one reason or another, a ship um, destined for public use. Um, in order to answer that question, one must consider both the past history of the vessel in question, since she became the property of the foreign state, and also the use to which she is likely to be put by that state in the future. Uh, the Philippine Admiral was a case where the ship had been purchased with uh, war reparations payments paid by the government of Japan. 
and was owned by the Philippine state, but operated by a commercial entity for profit by that commercial entity. And when she was arrested by creditors of the commercial entity, the government sought to intervene and claim immunity, saying this is a government-owned ship. And the Privy Council concluded that that was not enough because she was a trading vessel. She always had been, and she always was going to be. But um, interestingly, uh, while we're looking at this, um, the, the court also looked at a Canadian decision towards the foot of page 108 in the Canadian Conqueror. Um, but in that case, the vessels in question had been acquired by the Cuban state and had simply been left at anchor. Nothing was being done with them. And in the Canadian Conqueror case, uh, re referred to and stayed down there, um, the vessels in question had not been put to any use by the Cuban government since they had acquired them. They were available for use by that government in any way it chose. And having regards to the political conditions obtaining in Cuba at that time, it was by no means improbable they would be used for other than purely commercial purposes. So in, in the Canadian Conqueror, the Canadian case court had concluded that the ships were entitled to immunity. But they were ships not in use, but held the fact they were sovereign property was sufficient because they may well at some stage in the future be used for sovereign purposes. So we say uh, that the court must bear in mind when inquiring as to in use or in use for commercial purposes, the purpose of the inquiry, which is to consider whether the state should be immune. And under the restrictive theory, the state loses immunity if the property has become a commercial cargo. Um, or, to use the words of section 24A, if it's in use or intended for use um, in commercial purposes. And then I think my lady mentioned the, the, the avionics case. If I could just turn up what Mr. Justice Mayles, um, as he then was said, in, in avionics, at um, tab 16. This was a case in which the judgment creditor uh, was seeking to enforce um, a judgment itself based on an arbitration award obtained in Nigeria and a, a Nigerian judgment. And the property against which the claimant was seeking to enforce was a building owned by the Nigerian government but leased on commercial terms to a company that then provided visa and passport services to um, the government. And at paragraph 38, <coughs> uh, Mr. Justice Mayles says as follows, uh, having recited the facts. Ultimately, however, the primary consideration must be the nature or character of the relevant activity. What is actually being done with, or in this case, on the property in question? That accords with the decision of the Supreme Court in Savas that the expression in use for commercial purposes should be given its ordinary and natural meaning, having regard to its context. And in this situation, even though the claim was connected with, or the enforcement was connected with, a property that was A, leased on commercial terms, and B, being used by the company pursuant to commercial contract with the Nigerian government, that was irrelevant because the actual purpose was the passport and visa application, which were a sovereign purpose. So that connection with commercial contract was not enough. And if one looks at page uh, paragraph 40 over the page, um, the uh, final part of paragraph 40, in this case, the property may be connected with a commercial transaction, namely a contract between the High Commission and OIS for the supply of services by OIS to the High Commission. But the purpose for which it is in use is the provision of visa and passport services to Nigerian citizens. So a connection with a commercial contract is not sufficient. Well, that's where the property is actually in use. So you've got a situation where you've got property that is being used for a purpose, and you have to decide whether that purpose is sovereign or commercial. It's fairly straightforward. Um, in this case, on your, on your analysis, the property is not in fact in use because it's sitting dormant on a ship until the ship gets sunk. 
And you say, well, the only way that one can look then at the relevant words of the statute are to look at its intended use. Or if there is no intended use, you um, treat the restrictive uh, approach uh, because it can't be shown that there is a commercial intended use. And therefore, it, it, in, in a case of cargo on board a ship, um, the words in use have no meaning whatsoever in Article 10. They can only relate to the ship and not to the cargo. That must be right as a matter of language. Um, may, may, may well be right as a matter of construction. But surely your case has to postulate that the words in use can have no meaning in relation to the cargo or ship. Well, it may be that you would say <laughs> that uh, if the ship owner is doing something with the cargo, with the consent of the cargo owner, then the cargo owner is using the cargo, for example, pumping a liquid uh, cargo around the tanks for swimming purposes, putting out a fire with a cargo of sand. These may be well, I think more obvious examples, but in front of the judge, uh, 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 there was a more uh, obvious example given of uh, an LPG cargo where the burn-off might be used for fuel. So right. there, no, but that, that, that's use that's used by the ship owner. That's no, that doesn't help you. Uh, well, that was the use, as I think. Yeah. I think we're uh, at least working on the premise at the moment that use for these purposes must be used by the cargo owner. The the um, example we give give in our skeleton argument um, is um, and my learned friend then turns this against me slightly with respect misunderstanding the point is that if you have a CIF sale contract where the government is the seller. We could see that it might be arguable that the contract of carriage was for the purposes of fulfilling the CIF contract. Well, another friend then turns out on its head and says, uh, assumes that we also mean when the government is the buyer, which we don't. But, my lady, I don't shirk from the fact, yes, that uh, apart from some thinking out of the box where we might come up with some examples where the cargo was in use, by reference just to the cargo, the words in use have probably no meaning, but certainly very. Very limited. Very limited. But we don't shirk from the fact that that is the correct construction of the Act. And firstly, as I've said, we rely on the, the international material that shows that it is well recognised the cargo on board is unlikely to be in use. Secondly, we rely on the wording of the Act itself. And the words in use are not then surplusage because the phrase is in use or intended for use, and it applies to both the ship and the cargo. So all of the words in the Act have meaning if the ship is in use and the cargo has an intended use. Uh, looking at <coughs> giving the word its ordinary and natural meaning, if we, if we pick up uh, section 10, um, that the um, cargo and the ship were, at the time the cause of action arose, in use or intended for use. And that can't, with respect, mean that they both have to be in use and intended for use. The natural meaning is that you look at either a use or an intended use, or either. Mm. Um, so if you can establish a use for the ship, that's enough for the ship without having to look at the intended use. And if you can establish an intended use for the cargo, that's enough without having to look at an actual use. But you don't have to show use and intended use for both ship and for cargo. practical terms in a scenario such as this, it's the actual use of the ship and the intended use of the cargo. Indeed, and that is likely to be the outcome in virtually all cases, yeah. and that is reflected in the United Nations Convention, where the use, the words intended for use were removed by reference to ship, yeah. but intended for use were deliberately left in, but with the word use in relation to ship. It just so makes one wonder why the draftsman of this particular act didn't simply say intended use of the cargo and the use of the ship? Because, um, my lady, there could be situations where the ship is not in use. Um, the uh, Median Conqueror case is one of those, and I think in the um, commission, um, the draft um, articles for the United Nations Convention, another example is given, for example, of a ship on a delivery voyage where she's not right. yet been put into service. So you could have 
intended use for a ship yes. rather than use. The same as you could have use for a cargo rather than intended use. So the, the words are there as a catch-all, however unlikely that, that the counter scenario is. So yes, in probably nearly every case, you will look at the use of the ship and the intended use of the cargo. But the alternatives are there to cover the position that you have the opposite. Well, the ship would be, on, would be in use on a delivery voyage, wouldn't it? Uh, it wouldn't need intended use for that. I'm, I'm struggling at the moment to see what intended use could cover for a ship. <laughs> well, the, the Canadian Conqueror example, again, which is why I sort of took the court to it, the ships were simply at anchor while the Cuban state decided what to do with them. They were doing nothing. Um, and the Canadian court concluded that they were sovereign property while they were doing nothing because the court, the Cuban government had not formed any intention as to their use. Um, You're going to um, take that as a convenient moment then? I was going to take that as a convenient moment. Very good. Well, we'll resume at two o'clock.